entitled today's sermon, The Gospel's Power Over Darkness. Our text is Acts 13, verses 1 through 12. As we come to Acts 13, we begin a new theme that's going to be the overarching theme for really for the rest of the book of Acts, which is the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. So now we're moving away from Jerusalem and to Antioch in Syria. And from there, we'll be traveling westward to the Mediterranean Sea and to the island of Cyprus. And soon in a few weeks, we'll be in Asia Minor. So let's read our text this morning, beginning in in verse 1 of Acts chapter 13. This is God's Word. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bargesus. He was with the the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking the people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw that what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to understand it. Will you apply it to us? All your commands, you tell, you tell us in your word what to believe and how to live. And so, Lord, will you help us today open this passage to our understanding and write it on our hearts eternally in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we saw how Herod was no match for the power of God. We saw how securely Herod had held Peter in prison. He had put him in chains. He had four squads of soldiers. Roman sentries were guarding the doors. There was an iron gate. Uh, out to the city, which was closed. But then we saw the ease with which the angel let Peter, led Peter out and he was set free. Peter's chains fell off and he walked right past all the guards and then this huge iron gate opened on its own for him. Herod's prize had gotten away. And then Herod was humiliated. He was eaten by worms and he died. The king, who would have people think that he was a god, was literally eaten from the inside out by unclean worms. And through it all, the Word of God grew and multiplied throughout the region. Now Luke reports of a time when the gospel triumphs over the forces of evil again. Uh, This time it doesn't overpower another evil king like Herod, but it overpowers one sent by Satan himself to trouble the missionaries and their mission. So the point is, God always wins. He always accomplishes everything He sets out to do. And in a significant way, the book of Acts recounts for us the way in which the ascended Christ continues His work through the apostles. Having ascended up to heaven, our Lord Jesus sends Holy Spirit, and He equips believers, He raises up leaders, and He commissions, and He sends out His ambassadors to take the gospel from from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Now, in Acts chapters 13 and 14, we see the two commissioned missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, taking the gospel out to the unreached places and seeking to make disciples there. The intentional sending out of missionaries to unreached locations was unprecedented up to this point. 
So far in the book of Acts, the gospel has advanced outside of Jerusalem mainly because of persecution. A few special cases of divine intervention took place, like when Peter was called to visit Cornelius and when Philip encountered the Ethiopian. But in other words, up to this point, people have been forced out of Jerusalem and therefore they have taken up mission efforts as a result of their being scattered by the persecution. Basically, as Christians were scattered, they were just going about chatting the gospel, carrying it with them. And by God's grace, they made some new disciples along the way. But in this particular passage, we see a planned attempt to take the gospel to the world. Here, the missionaries are intentionally sent out, which is evidence that the church is beginning to grasp a bit of God's heart to make the gospel known to the ends of the earth, as Jesus had commanded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Well, before telling us where the missionaries travel, Luke reminds us that these two men were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And we, we need to recognize and remember the absolute necessity of walking by the Spirit and not walking according to the flesh when we're living out Jesus' mission. Now from Seleucia, which is a port for Antioch, Paul and Barnabas sailed west to the island of Cyprus stopping first at the eastern port of the island at a place called Salamis. You remember from chapter 4, verse 36, that Barnabas was a native of Cyprus and that the Hellenist had already begun some work there in Cyprus, uh, chapter 11, verse 19. What's more, there were other Christians from Cyprus who belonged to the church at Antioch, as we read in chapter 11, verse 20. Now, this missionary effort from Antioch employed a strategy that would characterize Paul's evangelism efforts elsewhere. Namely, they started to proclaim the Word of God in local Jewish synagogues. We see that in, chapter, in verse 5. And pragmatically, that makes sense because the Jews knew and believed the Scriptures, although they failed to see Jesus as the fulfillment of them. Nevertheless, the motivation for starting in the synagogues may also have been driven by the conviction that God's promise to, the Israel, to Israel's patriarchs demanded that the gospel first be preached to Jews and then to the Greeks. But as Paul and Barnabas labor, they work this 90-mile width of island until they arrive at Paphos. There they encounter a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And they also meet a Gentile named Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus was a proconsul, the, the Roman governor of Cyprus, and we're told that he was an intelligent man. So with that background and context in mind, I, I want us to consider three important truths from these verses this morning. The first is found in verses 4 through 7, and that is that some people will be open to God's Word. Sergius Paulus summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the Word of God. Now, we know from what the Bible teaches us about anthropology that no one seeks the one true God unless God is at work in a person's life. So we, we need to get our anthropology right when we study Scripture. What does Paul say in Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 10 and 11? None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one goes, does good, not even one. Jesus says in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So we can't look at a man like Sergius Paulus and think that on his own, that there's something good in him or because he was an intelligent man, well, that caused him to seek God. No. If he is interested at all, then God is initiating a relationship with Sergius Paulus. He's working in his heart and life, drawing him to himself, this is all part of the spiritual journey, which God is initiating and bringing to fruition. We're simply watching the video of how it went down. So God's, God in His good providence perhaps causes Sergius Paulus to, to hunger for more out of life than, than the idolatry of his day. Uh, perhaps he's causing him to question the counsel of his personal false prophet, Bar-Jesus. A name, by the way, which means son of the Savior. While Bar-Jesus may have promised to know the way of salvation, Paul's message was radically different from anything else that he taught. Paul is preaching the biblical gospel, 
free justification through the finished work of Jesus received through the instrument of faith, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, for God's glory alone. And Paul's teaching apparently attracted Sergius Paulus because God works in the hearts of people as he's drawing them to himself, and he does that through his word. You know, when we engage neighborhoods and even nations with the gospel, we should expect that some people will be open to, to the message because God is always working to save sinners. He's drawing people to Himself in every culture, in every corner of the world. He's advancing His global kingdom. So we may find an audience with the down and outers, those who are the poor and the uneducated and the marginalized, or we may find an audience with the up and outers, those who are powerful, wealthy, and influential. In this case, Paul and Barnabas found an audience with an influential leader. Their experience reminds us that we never know to whom the Lord would direct us that He wants to hear the gospel. Their, their experience reminds us of that. And now Paul and Barnabas were nobodies. They were really nobodies compared to this Roman proconsul. Yet, here they find themselves in front of him. And they're speaking the good news to his heart. You remember Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 21, 26, he said that, that the conversion of the powerful is rare. But here in Paphos, a powerful man found himself attracted to the word because God was at work in his heart. So we should be encouraged that some people will be open to the gospel because God is at work. Well, secondly, and here's the other side of the coin, some people will oppose God's word. And that's found in verses 8 through 11. The opponent... And this passage is Bar-Jesus, also known as Elimus, a name which means sorcerer. We read that in verse 8. Now we need to remember that Scripture does not divide people into good people and bad people. It divides people into the lost and the found. Those who are children of God and those who are children of Satan. Those who are alive to God because He's caused them to be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit and those who are dead in their trespasses and sins and those who follow the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air as Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2. Bar-Jesus is a sorcerer. He is under the power of his father, the devil. The Romans placed value on omens and divination and so forth. They also thought that Jews had inside information on spiritual matters, a fact which helped to establish Bar-Jesus as this popular sage. However, we're told that he was a false prophet. He was in touch with dark powers. And he was a magician, not in the sense of somebody who pulls a rabbit out of a hat, but he is a superstitious occult leader. He opposed the word of God that Paul and Barnabas taught. And notice Bar-Jesus tries to turn the proconsul away from the true faith, seeing these missionaries as a threat to his prestige and his livelihood. And when a person's under the power of Satan following the course of this world, this lostness manifests itself in any number of ways. So when the gospel confronts, sometimes heated opposition follows. And in verse 9, Luke alerts us to the shift of Paul's name, from Saul's name to Paul. Did you catch that? Paul was probably his Roman name. And since his missionary ventures would be in the Greco-Roman territory, it makes sense for him to be addressed primarily as Paul from this point forward. Furthermore, from this moment on, Luke gives prominence to Paul. No longer is he the person who accompanies Barnabas. But the roles are reversed. Paul will be mentioned first, or he'll be mentioned alone. Now, the confrontation between the missionaries and Bar-Jesus was intense. You see that in verses 9 through 11. Perhaps you think Paul's re resulting curse here on this man was mean-spirited. You know, maybe not such a nice thing to do or say. But what Paul is doing is he is speaking the truth. Besides, the fate of Sergius Paulus' soul was at stake in this situation, and Paul, out of compassion, wanted him to believe the gospel. Paul understands that God is the one who saves, but Bar-Jesus is opposing the gospel. He belongs to his father, the devil, who's the father of lies. Paul says Bar-Jesus is the enemy of all righteousness and that he's full of all deceit. 
Therefore, led by the Holy Spirit, Paul must confront this head on. And what's more, remember how firmly Jesus spoke about those who hindered children from coming to Him? He said in Matthew 18, verse 6, that it would be better for them to tie a millstone around their neck and to jump into the sea than to cause someone to stumble away from the faith. Eternal life is serious business. Paul is filled with Holy Spirit. Bar-Jesus is filled with deceit and trickery. Paul is a child of God. Bar-Jesus is a, an enemy of all that is right. Paul is a, announcing the way of salvation. Bar-Jesus is perverting the way of salvation. Instead of abdicating real conversion, Bar-Jesus advocates spiritual perversion. As a consequence, the Lord judges Bar-Jesus and strikes him blind, perhaps representing spiritual blindness. Now, this move was particularly fitting since this man was a proponent of darkness. His judgment was a foretaste of what happens to all who fail to bow the knee to Jesus, that they will be thrown into utter darkness one day. Now, for a moment, let's consider three personal exhortations that are really implied in this encounter between Paul and Bar-Jesus. And remember, we're still under the main point, too, that there are those who oppose the gospel. But the first exhortation is this. We need to view opposition from a Christian perspective. We need to expect spiritual warfare when we do gospel ministry. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there's a demon under every rock, but spiritual warfare is real. The Bible is crystal clear on that, so we need to be aware of that. We need to pray against that, and we need to persevere through that. Because Christians today will be opposed not only by Islamic terrorists, but also by secularists in the media, by professors at universities, by philosophers, atheists, and people who just like to antagonize others. Anyone who opposes God's Word and His Gospel, and of course His Son Jesus Christ, is under the power and influence of Satan. Remember, there's, there's no middle ground here. You're either lost or you're found. You're either for Jesus or you're against Him. Opposition is inevitable. We've seen that throughout our study of Acts. It's the same today. However, great joy is found when we stand firm in the truth in the face of opposition. We'll experience great joy as we encounter opposition for living faithfully to Jesus Christ. Through adversity, God gives us the opportunity to advertise the power of the gospel. He, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. When some people see Christians standing firm in the face of demonic opposition, it affects them. What's more, we're not alone when we face op opposition for making the gospel known. The Lord of heaven and earth has promised that He would be with us and that He is for us, according to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. That means it is important that we do not assume that we are in the wrong place or that we are heading in the wrong direction or that we're doing the wrong thing when we face opposition. In fact, it may indicate that we're exactly where we should be and that we're doing exactly what we must do whenever we do face opposition. In this case, Holy Spirit led the missionaries into a spiritual war zone, much like the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This passage, like others in Acts, helps us understand opposition. We need to view opposition from a Christian perspective. The second uh, exhortation implied in this passage is we, we should speak boldly. I don't suggest we go around talking to our opponents exactly like Paul addressed Bar-Jesus here. I mean, Paul's being carried along by Holy Spirit to say what he says and to do what he does because it's part of the Scripture. But we should seek to boldly tell people the whole biblical gospel. And that includes sharing with them, at some point, the terrifying consequences that they're going to one day face if they refuse to bow the knee to King Jesus. Although it's uncomfortable for us, Sharing this truth is, is really an act of love. Notice Paul doesn't say, Now, Elamus, I know you have your perspective and I have mine, and both perspectives are acceptable, they're equal. No, Paul challenges us to speak boldly into our postmodern world, into a world that preaches tolerance with everything but the truth of Christ and His gospel. And we should speak boldly anyway, the third implied exhortation from this passage is that we need to trust wholeheartedly in the power of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Because 
The gospel really is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16 Notice that here we see that the Holy Spirit overthrew the evil one, the apostle confounded the sorcerer, and the gospel triumphed over the occult. So we need to let this story encourage us in our witness. We need to maintain an unshakable confidence in the gospel, an unshakable confidence in the Spirit's power to overcome obstacles and to open people's hearts and minds, regardless of how many times we present the gospel and have it rejected. Maybe God only wanted us to plant the seed. Maybe He intended for us to water the seed that somebody else had already planted. And then sometimes we do get to present the gospel and see the harvest right before our very eyes. And that brings us to the third main point from our text this morning, which is that some people will embrace the gospel. And we found that in verse 12. Notice here Luke concludes this section by telling us a great report that while the darkness of judgment came on bar Jesus, the light of salvation burst onto this Gentile ruler, Sergius Paulus. Verse 12, then the proconsul believed, he's speaking of Sergius Paulus, when he saw what had occurred, this miraculous sign that fell on bar Jesus, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. As in the early chapters of Acts, a miracle provided an occasion to proclaim the gospel. And this prominent Roman official who had no religious background in Judaism became a member of the family of God. Miracles are not always um, healings that take place. Sometimes miracles are judgments. But we ought to let this, converse, this conversion story encourage us as we seek to make the gospel known to unbelievers that some people will repent. They will turn to Christ when a bold witness makes the good news clear to them. God is at work in the world. He's bringing all sorts of people to faith in Christ through the witness of faithful men and women. So your Sergius Paulus is out there right now. And he has been prepared and he's waiting to hear the gospel from you. You're the instrument that God intends to use to bring salvation. Father, thank you today for this portion of your word. We ask that you'll apply these truths to our heart and mind. Help us to understand the things that we've learned today and read in your word in the context of the fulfillment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and encourage us all the more with your promises until he returns. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.